Welcome to the Agile Wire. Brought to you by Wisconsin Agility. We want you to get agile and stay agile. Now here are your hosts, Jeff Bubbles and Chad Beyer. And we're recording. All right, kick us off, Jeff. All right, we have uh, Chris Lucasen and Robin um, Sherman on the podcast today. They're, so their co-authors are also been the stewards of the Professional Scrum Product Owner Advanced course. Um, so we're going to dive into a lot of product ownership stuff today. So Robin, Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah. All right. So I think we were talked about just diving into like, what are these big common problems that we see most product owners facing in the world? So I don't know. I'll kick it over to you, Chris. What do you, what do you think? What are the, some of the big ones that stand out in your mind? Ooh, like the biggest one, uh, like there's, there's so many things that product owners run into. Well, I think the, I think the, the, the biggest question I always get is like, how do I get more mandate or more of a mandate? And often not realizing that mandates are not handed out, but it's something you, you sort of earn along the way. So the answer is somewhere in your behavior. And I think that's the biggest problems, problems product owners run into that they, need to be more conscious about how they behave and how they interact with their environment mm -hmm. and the mandate can follow yeah it's like agency to like make decisions uh, that's how i yeah. would describe it S same thing is that what we're talking about like they maybe don't feel like they have the control or the ability to make certain decisions or certain calls uh, yeah. okay robin how about you Full. what do you think are some of the bigger um you know problems that product owners face yeah, well, actually, I've been uh, been uh, teaching this workshop uh, today uh, around value maximization, um, and value maximization really is kind of the, the 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 biggest challenge, I would say. Uh, like Chris said, there's many, um, but value maximization is really this some for some re weird reason maybe it's this tricky thing that people can't seem to figure out, um, leading to all these questions: How do I actually maximize value of a product? How do I uh, identify the potential value, how do I estimate value, mm -hmm. then move on to prioritizing roadmaps, backlogs, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but really, th there's this, this struggle, which I see in every organization. We want to maximize value, but we just don't know how. Yep. So I would say that's probably the biggest one. And volume is so much easier to measure. So like the number of things done is just what a lot of oh, companies yeah. go to, right? Instead of value. And Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and and actually today I had a quite uh, quite advanced group. I uh, I told them even <laughs> they're doing a pretty good job regarding measuring and tracking and steering on product analytics stuff. Uh, and we got into this discussion how actually a lot of product owners, but also organizations, uh, are measured in the velocity or predictability or all these kind of fundamental things that, of course, you need. Eh? You need some speed, but. Velocity, as we all know, is not the key thing to actually deliver value. Mm -hmm. Chad, what yeah. do you think? What are what's the one of the most common problems you think you see? You know, I think something that Jeff and I see when we're working with um, teams and their backlogs is that we just we see a lot of product backlogs. We were actually just at a conference today giving a talk. We see a lot of product backlogs filled with tasks and solutions instead of impact and outcome statements. And, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to place blame, but if we're thinking about, well, who's responsible for not letting that happen to your product backlog? Well, there's a, there's a, ro a role in accountability for that, right? The product owner. And so I, I think one pattern we see is we, we skip over or we store somewhere else outside the product backlog those impactful outcome statements and value statements and then we end up ordering all these little detailed tasks and 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 then everything everything with scrum sort of crumbles because of that right so i i think there's a huge opportunity for product owners to get their backlogs in order like wait, no wait, pun intended Chad, are you, are you are you now saying that a product backlog can contain more than user stories i think i am yeah <laughs> and 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 if it does have user yeah. stories make sure it's like you know, a why and a what statement, not some implementation details of like, we need to create the database tables. Well, okay. That's yeah. not a product backlog. Yeah, it's, 
It sounded like you want to have a list of problems that you still want to solve. Yeah, absolutely. Or conversations that you still want to have. Yeah. And if you're a decision maker, which you are as an, a product backlog uh, owner, right, as a product owner, it makes it so much easier to make those tough trade-off decisions when you're looking at impact outcome statements uh, in your list, right? Instead mm. of a bunch of detailed tasks, right? So I, in a way, I feel bad for a lot of product owners out there. However, it got to that point because, you know, it's 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 out there. Like We, we continue to see this as a pattern. I'm not sure how much... Uh, the both of you but see what it. causes that so, so, so i think that, so that gets you, to, you see it out there but what, what what is causing that so i think that gets to my number one common problem is it's the product definitions that i think most organizations have mm-hmm. and so i think the product definitions are too narrow they're based off a component they're based off of a system they're not based off an experience or something that somebody actually will pay for or cares about and so when mm. then I, I've had this happen multiple times where I go to like a director or a VP where, you know, they come out of training and they're like, or they ask me afterwards and they're like, I really don't want to go to these, these sprint reviews. And I'm like, well, why not? You're paying all this money for these teams, like yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Right. And he's like, yeah, but like, I don't really care what they're doing. That's just a means to the end. And I'm like, okay, well now we don't even have a right product definition. We don't, if you're not building something someone cares about and is willing to spend, they're already spending lots of money on it then we need to work on like what that definition is and be able to show something that people care about. So I think that's yeah, maybe that just a structural it. thing, right? Like it's just the structure isn't set up for them to succeed or it's very difficult and we can do a better job of that inside of organizations so to I'm, enable definitely. partners. I'm imagining our listeners, right? We've said a lot of conceptual problem statements now. I Do you guys know of any like literature out there that would maybe give listeners a practical approach to this, all these problems? <laughs> like like practical product management for product owners, yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, like a book, a book with that title <laughs> would be awesome. Do you know any good yeah, books? Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you mention it. <laughs> that would be awesome, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. that's actually, that, that's exactly the line of thought that Robin and I had like, well, when was it? Like two or three years ago when we... Uh, where we had done so many of these PSPO trainings and, and we said that, that there's a need to get this concept um, in a different format to more people. People that maybe not be able to go to the training or want it as a sub-reference or, um, or just enjoy a different format. And I think the story that, that we put out there with PSPOA was so powerful and helped so many people mm-hmm. that it was valuable enough to spend the time in and create create a written reference from yeah yeah it's actually quite funny because the the storyline uh basically we we just read, wrote this book uh, practical product management for product owners just came out uh a couple of weeks ago um and we're kind of promoting starting promotions now uh for example joining uh, chat and jeff uh, today um but this book has been in the making for quite some time. And it's actually quite funny that as Agile or Scrum trainers, uh, you know all about how Scrum works and release fast and oh, get, feedback get feedback and all that kind of stuff. And then you start writing a book and all of the all of a sudden the world changes back to kind of this waterfall approach again, right? With a big bang release. Well, you're a developer. You, you love developing stuff. So you get lost in the weeds of developing and you can spend... Exactly months refining the words and little texts and icons and graphics all yep. kind of fun stuff yeah but it did just come out and uh, i think indeed it's a uh, it's a really nice read for uh, for folks who are uh maybe uh, a product owner for uh, let's say a year maybe two years by now mm-hmm. yeah. um so they have some experience under their belt they kind of get the idea of how scrum works um, and are now looking to address some of those challenges that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually figuring out what is my product definition, we have some ideas and guidance uh, for that. Um, figuring out how can you actually deliver optimized value. Uh, There's some ideas in the book about that as well. Uh, of course, uh, this was all created in collaboration with uh, the community of professional Scrum trainers at Scrum.org, uh, who haven't necessarily wrote the book together with us, um, but of course gave a lot of inspiration and uh, well, all the stuff that we keep using in the trainings that we teach. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think another common use case for the book would be um, you go through the course and you're like, oh, I, I have this happen a lot where a lot of people think they're advanced and then they go through the course and they're like, oh my gosh, there's so much here. Like, 
I just need more, you know, like I need to refreshers. Like I need to dive into this piece and that piece. And that's great. And that book would be a really good compliment of, okay, I've heard it. I've gone through some activities. I tried applying part of it, but here's a deeper dive and another look at it where I can slow it down and I can, and I can really consume different pieces of the, of the course, um, with different examples from different instructors. Right. So it's always good to hear different perspectives. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And what we also try to do is, is not just to transcribe the PSP rate, or we partially did that, um, but also for every topic that's in there, we try to give you two or three mm -hmm. other variants, um, how you could look at that. For example, for a decision maker, there's different ways of looking at how you make decisions. And in the book actually goes deeper. And the same is true for the visionary. There's like two or three different formats to how to do storytelling or work with a vision. Um, so if the one that you were taught in PSPOA isn't doing it for you, then there's other alternatives that you can draw from. Yeah, that's so you awesome. just kind of rattled off a couple stances, but maybe we should dive into some of those stances just to oh. give everybody, just if you haven't gone through the course, you might not have be, or the, seen the book yet, you might not be familiar with all those. So let, let's just talk through maybe the misunderstood stances first, and then we can get into the preferred stances. So, Or, or, let, or let's talk about what a stance actually sure. is. Sure, well, that's a great spot to start. I'll let, <laughs> I'll let you two kick it off. Like, why, why not call them, I don't know, patterns instead of stances? Well, uh, maybe Robin can can explain why stance is such an important concept in golf. <laughs> Are you now referring to my obvious, uh, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the thing that resonates, I, I'm a jiu-jitsu practitioner, and uh, the way you the stance is it's determining your success. And Robin has no affinity with martial arts. However, is a great golfer. And we discovered that stance is super important in golf as yeah. well. Um, Definitely stance and posture that kind of stuff yeah so uh, what is a stance well basically it's it's uh, a, a collection uh, so you could also call it patterns maybe um, but these stances this is something uh, that is always temporary um, so much like a stance in martial arts or a stance in golf um, it's a stance that you temporarily take um, and you can either do this consciously um, for example by uh, choosing to adopt a preferred stance which we'll get into um, or in, unconsciously by maybe showing these behaviors or having an attitude which is not super effective, which we now refer to as the misunderstood stances. Um, but it's always something that is temporary. And much like a stance in golf, you take your stance, you get ready to take the shot, um, and then you basically pull the trigger and you hit that golf ball, right? Um, and the same goes for a stance as a product owner. So one of these misunderstood stances is um, basically the, um, the, the story writer. Um, and the story writer is someone who basically, based on all the inputs from the, uh, the stakeholders, from experts, from customers, etc., uh, writes down perfect user stories with great acceptance criteria and a lot of detail. Um, oh, like Chet's and, backlog. Yeah. Not my <laughs> backlog. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the backlogs I continue to see. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so a lot of detail in there, but it's always something you do temporary, right? You're not a story writer spending your days in Jaira all the time, but you may spend an entire morning there if you're a good story writer trying to perfect your user stories. Uh, the question is, though, is that the most effective way to be a product owner? Um, and that's kind of the thing with these misunderstood senses. Yeah, yeah, and, and and they're not completely useless. Eh? So they all have have a, a time and place as well. It's just like it's not what the role is all about. Um, like like the story writer, but also the, the gatekeeper. Um, I was director of development at a, at a large software company, and and people would come all the time to our developers, um, and basically pull them out of their concentration. Say, oh, can you build this? Oh, I need to look at this. This is really important. And they couldn't get any work done. And I had over 70 people. So at some point, I revoked the key card access for everybody except engineering to that floor. Moved my office just outside that uh, the key reader. And every time somebody would come there and they would flip their cards, I'm not working. Hey, Chris, why is it not working? And I could, okay, come in. And I spent my time gatekeeping the entire department, uh, which was great. They finally got some work done. It also meant they never spoke customer support, sales, marketing. Within two months, they had no clue what they were doing and why they were doing it. I had also cut off their only way to get feedback, as disruptive as it was. 
So uh, don't stay and in the sand too long. A lot more boring, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, gate, the gatekeeper the bouncer the is not the best job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another what about you, Chad. Uh, what I was what I was curious about when we were talking about the stances again is, and I'm sure you know. Uh, disclaimer forever all the listeners we all teach the advanced product owner course so we probably are all at risk of going into like trainer mode and, and geeking out on the entire contents of this and we can definitely go through all of the stances but we get a question often whether somebody should go to the advanced product owner course or read this advanced product owner book right this this practical product management for product owners or go to the level one product owner course and I'm curious how both of you navigate that answer. Jeff and I, and well, mm -hmm. uh, I try to speak for both of us, Jeff, we mm -hmm. typically try to explain that the first product owner course is more about like what product ownership is, like relating it to a sport. Jeff and I both play basketball. We coach basketball. We like mm -hmm. basketball. Nice. And if I were to go to a course on the rules of what basketball is and how the game is played, I'd relate a little bit more of that to product ownership. You're learning about what product ownership is in the first course. But yeah, then the sure. second course is like, it's you're leveling up. This is about you. And I love that in your book title, you have this, for product owners. Like, this is a serious look at yourself because of the way you both speak to stances, right? Like, a stance is how you bring yourself to an environment, to a situation, to a game, to a to a, a grapple in jujitsu, right? Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. A, it's how you bring yourself. And I, I see the same thing. Like that would be like practicing basketball with a coach and team members. And exactly. how do I, how do I, what kind of team player am I? Like all the nuance of how a human yeah. brings himself. So I don't know, do you consider that, do you see the differentiation between those similar in? in Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I would say, uh, or most of the time, I actually introduced the PSPO course as this is where you learn how to be a product owner within a Scrum team. And the PSPO advanced is how do you get to be more of an agile product manager? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we assume you got all the basics in place, uh, or at least from my perspective, <laughs> it's the basics. Uh, and I want to then with, uh, with the PSPOA classes, dig into product ownership more, or sorry, uh, product management more, pro uh, agile product management more, uh, much like you want to do yourselves as well. Um, so the, the, the PSPO one is basically laying all the foundations to be effective as a PO in Scrum and then advancing from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I, I, I think when people leave the advanced course or when they read this book, they leave with that, like you're refreshed, but you realize you probably have a lot to work on. I feel like that's what we yeah. see over and over again. Even as a trainer, when you go through it, right? As trainers, it's always a selfish thing. Like we we get so much development out of teaching things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I am curious. One of the questions I want to ask later is like, what is like one of your favorite golden nuggets from the the courseware right. in the book? I, I have my my answer ready, but but I guess mm -hmm. as we 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 just rattled through a few of the under misunderstood stances. Maybe we jump to, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll pose this as a question. There's six stances, correct? Six preferred stances that the book talks through. Mm -hmm. Can we like... There might be a, can, there might be a seven. Oh, uh, really? Like, so it, it, it's, well, it, it's, it's just a model. All models are wrong, oh, yeah, some are sure. useful. Yeah. So um, I'm sure we forgot one. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just a way of mapping uh, behavior. And, and I really like your basketball analogy. Like, like PSPOA would definitely be about how you perform in the field, how you interact with your team, but also why you're, you're such a super effective player. However, when we're playing against this type of opponent, it turns out you're super ineffective. Yep. And that's your own fault. So you should have played differently. Yep. And getting this awareness that how I behave actually depends on the environment. And there are different stances or, or interactions that I can take to be more effective. That is what PSPO is about. Yeah. It's beyond the rules of the game. It is you in the game in connection with the environment. Yeah, and I think we even said it. I think you wrote it somewhere in the beginning of the book. Like, 
you've led, you've won some awards for some product development efforts, and you've had some failures. And just like when you go to play a sport, you show up to, you bring yeah. yourself to the basketball game with the idea that you're going to win, but you lose games yeah. all the time, right? And so it's product development. There's going to be a lot more failures than there are successes, right? If we're all being honest Absolutely. with ourselves. So, but again, yeah. that's what I love about this. The book, the courseware, it talks you through that. It, it, every stance, I think, I think the six has it covered really well. But of course, there could be more we could add. But it, it really does cover it. So with that, I'm a long-winded in- intro to a, a question. If we went around the room, and I know it's unfair to have us pick one of the stances that that we like or stands out to us the most, but is there one? Like, does anyone have one where they're like, I really like spending time in this one? Well, I want to hear Jeff's answer for my, I don't know. My favorite one is the experimenter. I just love thinking of creative ways to validate assumptions that just, I don't know, are strategic that can save a lot of risk. Like I, I enjoy doing that. I love brainstorming those different ideas with different people. That's my favorite one to jump into. Nice. What about you, Ted? So I'll even key in on a specific framework, the three by three framework for product Mm. pitches. So in the visionary section, I believe, right? Um, Since being, since being introduced to it and you came up with this, right, Chris, this is Mm. yours original three by three. Yeah. Um, In one of your previous books, product, product samurai. So I have been amazed as a business owner, you know, Jeff running our, our part, we run our company together. The number of times when we're like, let's do a three by three for that. And and we yep. do it like all it's, it's becoming second nature now. It's just like, it yep. doesn't even have to be a product pitch. There's so many yep. value pieces of value when you're just like, Hey, uh, yeah, let's just to articulate this better. Let's just run this through a three by yep. three. And yeah, I think story I writing and storytelling is so undervalued. Yeah, too. I love yeah. it. So, you know, we have one that we do in the course. Obviously, we wrote our own up and we use it as an example over and over again. But even when we're developing our own courseware, we run it through a three mm-hmm. by three. And it's so anyway, that that's but, worth the price of admission right there, in my opinion. Like some of those small little golden nuggets, they, yeah. they can be transformational in how you operate going forward. Well, speaking of, of hidden nuggets, um, if you look very closely at the icons that we use for the stances, um, and you look very closely at the faces of Chris and Robin, you may figure out which stances are our favorite stances. <laughs> so you've been you've thought about this question before. Well, it's one of the perks of, of having a great illustrator. <laughs> but if you design the characters to be uh, representing your stances, you can kind of influence the, the characters, uh, right? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so oh, you will uh, find that the, the influencer very closely resembles Robin and the experimenter very closely resembles me. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So I'm assuming that means that your favorite stance is the experimenter as well, uh, Chris. Yeah, it is. It is. It and I, I, I have this deeply, and maybe that's also martial arts. I have this deeply Shoshin mindset that I know nothing, and that everything I know is an assumption, and I have to go out and learn. And, and sometimes that's frustrating, and sometimes I find myself stepping into something like, ah, oh, obviously this is going to work, or customers are going to like this, and this makes just just makes sense. But it doesn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I should have gone out there and talked to people. And every time I, I find myself falling for that trap again. So, so I'm very consciously always asking for feedback, always getting information, always placing these little bets, trying to discover where the real value is. Uh, last year September, I joined the startup. Uh, so we simply do not have the resources to build everything. So you have to do this in a way by learning, and it keeps us humble and gentle and always on our toes mm-hmm. trying to discover this where value is and it, it, it's kind of intangible and always fleeing and you're always running after it as an experimenter. Robin, why do you love the uh, influencer stance? Yeah, so when talking about favorites, it's actually two because it's the visionary um, and kind of my or one of the sources of inspiration uh, for visionary stances is of course 
represented by the character of Steve Jobs, which is also a source of inspiration for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time in that visionary stance, actually. Um, and as, uh, looking back at the last probably six to nine months, um, at least half of the week, if not more, was spent in the visionary stance, uh, not, not kind of creating my own product vision or strategy or roadmaps or that kind of stuff but actually helping product owners to uh, establish those. Yeah. Um, because quite a lot of uh, POs are actually struggling to create a, a strong, powerful product vision and be able to communicate that effectively. Um, so I've been helping quite a couple of customers to establish that in the, the recent months. Um, but indeed, my favorite is actually the influencer stance. Um, and together with uh, another colleague, PST, Willem Vermaak, uh, I wrote the book Master the Art of No, which is really about stakeholder management. Um, and it's just this fun thing that if you can uh, get your stakeholders on board, um, if you change your sprint review, uh, where I often use the metaphor of sitting in your car as a good uh, metaphor for a sprint review, um, if you uh, approach stakeholder management more strategically or as a tactical effort instead of letting it happen to you, there's a lot of things that can actually change. And while I see that a lot of POs, it actually happens to them, stuff, uh, new deadlines, new projects, new ideas, new now you have to do this and drop the rest, all of that stuff kind of happens to us. Um, and there are some techniques to make that kind of go away a little bit at least um, and deal with your stakeholders more effectively, collaborate more effectively actually. So. I'll say something that Chad and I say all the time in the class. We don't like this, the phrase stakeholder management. We rather, we like the phrase better, stakeholder engagement. Thoughts? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's stakeholder like, guess, collaboration. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not about managing them. I feel like that's like controlling them. Like that's maybe where my mind goes at least. And it's not about that. It's about informing them, bringing them along, collaborating with them, right? Engaging them in the process building relationships so you can say no to them respectfully and they can push back and yeah. you can push back and then like they can bring, keep bringing it up if they still think passionately about this idea or whatever that they, that we should do it. Um, so it's, it's much more about relationships I think than it is about managing people. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I, I like the, more uh, working towards leading your stakeholders um, in a sense and not managing, but maybe leading them in the right direction, showing, uh, by doing, uh, leading by example, kind of referring back to, hey, but what's the value? Hey, what's the mission that we want to achieve? Uh, hey, what's the outcomes that we desire? And kind of showing by, uh, by example, um, leading them in the right direction. Uh, I think that could definitely be something a PO can do. Um, but management indeed kind of feels more like controlling them in a sense, yeah. uh, instead of engaging with them or collaborating. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I also like the word relationship in there. It's like as a father of four, I uh, I always find it's a great metaphor for working in uh, with teams and organizations. And I don't have a spouse management strategy. <laughs> um, she would be very upset if she listens to that. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't work. And it doesn't work at home and it doesn't work in, in the company as well. So it's all about the things that Robin said, like, like living the example, but also really listening to what other people want. Yeah. So with the stances, I ha you guys have all the kinds of things rattling around in my brain. So if, um, if somebody's listening to this and like, I'll give an example. I see some benefits in when you're weaker or maybe you just, yeah, when you're better in one stance or weaker in another one, I'll use Jeff and I as an example. We're 50, 50 partners in the business we run. Um, we don't use Scrum to run our company, but we do a lot of practical things that Scrum and Agile and everything, right? So when we're talking about things, I tend to lean, I, I tend to do a lot of visionary talk, but I don't take action. And Jeff, he's my, he balances me out because he's like, we should try this. We should try this. We should try this. We should, he's, he's the experiment. He's, and not to say that he's, he isn't visionary, but I fall short to follow through on the experimenter. And because I'm paired with Jeff, like we're, we're, we spend every day together almost, I think we make a really great pair in that, right? Because we balance that out. So if that is the case, and we uh, let's say we all agree with that premise, does that mean there should be more than one product owner in Scrum? What? 
What did Chad <laughs> just say? Or is there some other collaborative approach that a product owner could take? Or are we suggesting that they have conversations in their own head uh, and balance the stances out? What, what, how would we answer that question? I think it's a great question. Uh, yeah, so I, the phrase I typically use is hire for your own weakness. Mm. So if you add people to your team, hire people that have skills that you do not have, uh, which is also like, I, I really like writing the book with Robin because he has different skill set than I have, much like you and uh, and Jeff have. And, and the combination makes makes for a better product. I, I think you can do that without splitting the accountabilities. Like let's keep the accountabilities with one person. But it doesn't mean that you don't listen to other people and you don't value their advice or make sure that you have those people on your team. Uh, I also profit from having somebody who's super structured. Um, I can also be very chaotic and I explicitly tell uh, tell more structured people, please bug me, chase me, uh, harass me to the point that you are annoyed because I'm, I'm not doing this or forgetting about this because I want to. It's just not in my nature. You have my full permission to keep bugging me until I actually do what you ask me. And by giving explicit permission, they are doing something that's very counter to their, their own natural stance because they just, well, I, I, he said he's going to do it, so why is he not doing it? Um, but by giving explicit permission, it actually works very well. Great answer. I like that. What do you think? What do you think, Robin? <laughs> do we need to split the accountability, or uh, how do how do we approach this? I think uh, Chris kind of captured this very well. Okay. Uh, nothing really to add here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I would just add that, like, I don't think we ever said a product owner should make all the all or any other decisions in a silo, right? They yeah. need to talk to people, they need to listen to different people, and then they need to take all that into consideration and make it and make a call. But we need one person to make the call. Multiple people making a call. If you're gonna be you're going to have different types of decisions being made, which then people get frustrated with that because they don't know how you're going to make decisions in the future. Then they want very detailed requirements. Then we get down to order takers and things are falling apart, right? So it's a cascading downward spiral, I feel like, if we have more than one, if we have many, many people trying to make decisions because uh, then no one makes decisions. I, I yeah. guess it kind of ties back to your uh, your big challenge, right, of uh, how do you actually identify products? Um, and the smaller the products are, um, if you find product owners for each of those very small components, you end up with a lot of product owners in your organization who maybe together have this big product that is actually shipped to customers. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say there's 10 or 15 of these POs working on a product. You have 15 people making a decision. Um, and maybe some of them are aligned in the same direction. Maybe some are not aligned and we're running in different directions. So. The question is, do we have product owners for those small components then? Or do we actually have a, let's say, bigger product owner, someone who is actually accountable for the value of the entire product, um, and basically have him, have him or her make the, the big overarching decisions? Uh, but then you kind of get into this, this scary topic of scaling, right? How do you effectively do product development, product management at bigger scale? Um, and that's challenging for a lot of organizations. Um, especially for those who have been around for many years. Uh, some companies we work with uh, exist for 100 years or more. Um, they haven't been software or IT companies, came from manufacturing, for example. Uh, very different structures, very different approaches to creating value again, uh, where in the old days, uh, the, the time you spend in screwing in screws in the, in the car kind of was the key thing. And if you were faster than someone else, we just replaced you. And then we started talking about resources like printers and scanners that are interchangeable. Uh, and nowadays we're in complex product development uh, talking about people again. And the world's kind of different than what it has been in this manufacturing approach. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes back to how do you define the product and then who is our product owner? And a lot of kind of flows from there. Uh, one of Those the are challenging topics. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes our PSPOA is a little different maybe than everyone else's uh, is that we spend quite a bit of time going off onto like a whiteboard, which we just like do a mural and we're drawing with our stylus and our iPads. 
And we talk mm -hmm. a lot about scaling and product definitions and then trade-offs. Like if you go this yeah. direction, here's what you're trading off. And and we will kind of walk through the ca cascading effects of that and what they're going to see. You can make those decisions. It's just like expect that you're going to have longer cycle times to value delivery if you have very many, if you have a lot of micro product def definitions inside of your organization. And so like we just help them like see the trade-offs and we spend a lot of time with that and walk through some examples. Um, I think that, you know, the slides and the mural activities have some of that, but like, I guess we dive pretty deep into that um, in our mm -hmm. courses. Yeah, and I think also that's it's it's not a class that I teach, so I can probably promote it over here. Uh, we have to, you have a professional scrum with Kanban, and, and, and the one thing that, that really blew my mind is how powerful the metrics are. I know how powerful the metrics are, but to see that again, and especially in relationship to the trade-offs that you just mentioned, putting a number on it saying this this is what the trade-off is this is what it means for your time to learn or for your time to respond mm -hmm. uh, go back to your markets is it acceptable that your fix bugs in this and this period of time or your release sequence is like this or when somebody comes up with a great idea it does take you six months to even respond to it if that's fine in your industry great probably isn't yeah I you know you said something earlier that I'm always replacing in my head. Like we were talking about the word management and we basically synonymously replaced it with control. And mm -hmm. the same thing happens when we're talking about scaling scrum. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm not taking us down too big of a tangent on scaling scrum, but we do talk about it in like, you know, right in product management, mm -hmm. the book and the courses. So I just wish, and this is what, I don't know. I'm kind of a change agent at heart. I like to rock the boat. So I think if you want to drive change, words matter on how we describe things. So what we I continually see is the phrase product, whether it's in front of product owner, whether it's in front of product backlog, it gets diluted because we start calling things products that aren't products. And if we just yeah. correct it in the moment, right? It'd be like somebody saying... Yeah. Um, I will pick you up. Hey, do you need a ride to work uh, next Monday? I'll pick you up in my car. Then they show up with two skateboards. And you're like, oh, I thought you were picking me up in the car. No, no this, this is a car. I call my skateboards cars. Yeah, but those aren't cars. Yeah. Like, I'm a car And owner. so same thing, right? <laughs> that's not a product backlog. That's, that's a backlog yeah. of functional skill set. You're a functional skill set yeah. owner. You're not a product owner. If we, you're not a... You're not a manager. This is the one where I could really get off, but like, you're not a manager. You're a controller, right? Because that's what a man management is about control. Let's just all be honest with ourselves, right? I think if we start to change those words in a kind, professional way, right? We don't have to uh, penalize people for using these words, but if we correct them and say, you're actually not an owner of a product right now, here's why, it might start to change all the craziness that we do where. We form scrum teams, quote unquote, around these very detailed um, functional skills. So I don't know. What do you? No, it makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, so I, I actually have a more positive turn on yeah, that story. Turn then. it around. So, uh, uh, so the situation I was in is like everybody nowadays calls themselves a leader. Ah, yes. um, so as a coach, I'm like, oh, I'm a leader of this. Okay, so let's define what a leader is and what a leader does. And, and then you also end up with exactly the same things. You know, but the things you're mentioning, that sounds a lot like control. It doesn't sound like leading. It doesn't sound you're removing impediments or helping people grow or removing obstacles or, or actually leading by showing the way. It, it sounds a lot like you're, you're trying to manipulate and control people. Uh, oh, we, we don't want to be that kind of leader, do we? Um, so I'm nudging them towards, like, okay, so what would be examples of good behavior? A behavior that we would associate with leadership. Wow. Okay, so when did we see this? And what can you do to, to show this to the organization? Maybe show a little bit less of, of that control apart. Yeah. That might actually work. I, Maybe from a different perspective. Is, um, I, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, to, to some degree, it helps to clarify ideas, right? And to clarify concepts. And then on the same page, I'm not sure if replacing management with control is uh, necessarily too helpful because you're kind of putting management in a bad, bad spot. Yeah. <laughs> and if we then talk about product backlog management, uh, is that a bad thing? 
Is it yes. now product, product control? 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 <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> um, but it's not just that. It's also inspiring people through clear order and making decisions and choices. And isn't that leadership? Yeah. Providing guidance and inspiration and making choices and helping them to self-manage. So is it then product backlog leadership? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> kind of makes self self leadership. <laughs> I don't know. So <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, making management kind of this bad thing is helpful, but I I do value the the or appreciate the discussion about hey, are we talking about the kind of controlling the situation kind of management? Yeah. Or are we talking about the uh, growing the uh, the organization, growing the team, improving the team, that kind of management? Or are we talking about uh, small steps, uh, improvement, change kind of management? Uh, so there's a lot of different management, right? It really boils down to what how do you hmm. define management? Yeah, I love, I love the nuance. And I'm not opposed to the word management. I'm opposed to what you're managing, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I have, yeah. I'm totally fine if we manage artifacts and, and backlogs. Oh, yeah. Managing yeah. people, that's right. We do it. Uh, it's ubiquitous in all of our organizations around the world. But there's also a lot of change that is happening decade after decade in how we think about that. And I think that's all I'm I'm just pulling on that thread a little bit. I'm, yeah, I yeah. hope I'm not offending <laughs> anybody who is has manager in their title. I just think these conversations are interesting uh, because words matter, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. but I, I love the nuance you added to it, Robin. That's awesome. I think maybe it, just it have actually it actually kind of connects nicely to one of the other topics in the training in the book, which is agile governance. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's also one of those things, right? If, if you talk about governance, there's a lot of words, there's a lot of concepts. Um, and I don't know, stuff like who does uh, performance management in a agile organization? Uh, you won't find the answer in the Scrum Guide. You won't find it in any other of the Agile frameworks. Um, so how you do performance management or capacity management is up to you. And let's let's kind of stick with the last one for a second. Uh, capacity management can mean many different things. It yeah. can be the capacity of the team. It can be the capacity of the hardware. It can be the load on the servers. There's so many different types of capacity. So you really need to define what that type of governance is and then who owns it. And typically the governance needs to change if you want to become more of an agile organization. So those are really interesting discussions in my experience. Yeah, I love it. I guess that's just a, a nudge for any listeners out there, like have a conversation about what does management mean? What does uh, governance mean inside of your organization? Why do we have that? You know, like what is the purpose of it? And if you go back to like, you know, foundations, it's like, well, management's here to make everybody else more productive than if they weren't there. So like, are we doing that? Why do we have governance? To create boundaries so we can like have a scope of control so we know what we have autonomy over and what we don't. And so that we can like really innovate inside of the space that it, it allows us to, right? So um, if governance is getting in our way, then how can we accomplish the same goal, but um, you know, better. So then like, like those are good, great questions to be asking, you know, your organization and your, the people you work with every day. Yeah, and often, often people don't realize that we created these yeah, rules, structures absolutely. and processes and we can act, so we can change them. So one company I, I, I work with, I started penciling down their process and we came down to a, a product development process of 258 steps. And I was like, uh, I stopped drawing after 258. I was like, what happened? How much more? Yeah. <laughs> it's like so many things went wrong. So we had to create rules. It's great. So how much energy did you spend? Oh, we spent a lot of time writing that down. How much time did you spend teaching the people about the mistakes that they made and, and making sure that they don't make them again? Like, we, we made a process. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Wouldn't it be just wiser to make the team smarter, which is also one of the great takeaways from the scaling part in the, in the PSPO is like the core thing is just make the team smarter. Yeah. Just grow the team, add product management skills to, to the team, make the team being able to self-manage more, self-control more, <laughs> self, self-lead more, um, but make this, just make them more capable and, and, and you get room to breathe. I think delegate more is also an important one, right? Yeah. When yeah. going back to the one product owner versus many product owners uh, discussion, uh, how much do you need to decide for yourself? How much do you delegate? Uh, there's some interesting exercises as well. 
um, yeah. for, for figuring that out and having some good discussions with your peer POs, if you have them in your organization or with your management or leadership, however you want to call them, mm -hmm. and kind of figure out what is the <laughs> mandate that you have. With yeah. Yeah, the challenge you started off with, uh, Chris, uh, what yeah. is your mandate? Uh, what is your authority? There's some good exercises and all kinds of ideas, uh, discussions that you could have around stuff like vision or budget or changes to the team. There's so many things you can agree on or decide upon. Um, interesting stuff to cover. Yeah, so I, I love it. I Knowing what is inside the book, we've only hit like on small Scratch pieces, right? Like, like I mean, there's piece. so many things covered, right? Governance, contracting, pricing. I mean, uh, the stances, we didn't even go through all of them. So. I think it's just maybe maybe to kind of steer this towards a summary for listeners, right? If they're considering, uh, yeah, if they're considering opening the pages of this book, because um, it just you know again just launched recently, right? What what's the magnetic pull? What's the what's the value prop? What, do we have a three by three pitch for this thing? Like what what would we what, what how would you summarize it? Who should read this? Every product owner on the planet? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a stab at it first, Chris, or do you want me to do it? No, you do it first. Uh, I, I've, okay. So uh, we haven't created a three by three just for, uh, for kind of pitching it right on the spot right now. Um, I'm not sure. Did we actually add that three by three example to the book, Chris, or do we just use it? I think you random? have one. No, 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 okay. There's so an example the there. actual pitch is then in the book, but <laughs> uh, since the the book is not the core product I focus on on a day by day <laughs> basis, I don't remember the pitch by heart. Um, but who should be reading this thing? Uh, product owners, product managers, product leaders, uh, agile coaches, uh, definitely as well. Um, I think one of the things uh, a lot of Scrum Masters, Agile coaches can improve on is their actual knowledge about product management. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this could be a really good starting point. Um, and of course, there's many books about product management, which they definitely should be reading when coaching a product owner. Um, this may be a good starting point uh, after having done the PSPO one course, for example. Um, uh, leadership or managers uh, who are either leading a team of product owners or who are responsible for uh, a, a product development group, including product owners, scrum masters, developers, um, they can all benefit from the ideas and concepts in this book, I believe. Um, and why they should be reading it is because we really want to help people take the next step in their product management journey, um, kind of moving beyond the basics of Scrum. Um, and really advancing, uh, moving or passing those challenges that we basically opened the discussion uh, uh, today. Um, and those are just a few that we address in the book. Awesome. So that would be my pitch. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Cool. Uh, yeah, so the only thing I have to add, so the, the one thing that I'm, I'm really proud about in, uh, in the book is that Yes, it's chock full of content and we have the stances and, and practical concepts and stuff you can do tomorrow. But weaving throughout the storyline is a, is, a, is a story about a young woman that starts a career as a product manager. And, and it's kind of like a novel description. So, so it's a storyline about somebody who's in that situation where we've all been, that we join a company and we're not really sure if they get Scrum and what product owner actually means. And as she evolves throughout the storyline. She runs into all these different stakeholders and she runs into these situations like vision, like talking to customers, making decisions. Uh, she, she has to figure out how to do metrics, how to convince people. And, and you can really follow her on her journey through the stances all the way up to eventually becoming really successful as a PO. And I think that's the underlying message that we, we're trying to give with the book. It, product ownership is really a journey towards creating value. And it's something we all started with in very humble beginnings. And we experiment our way through it. So I hope the book is helpful and makes people smile, makes them cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and reflect upon yourself and most of all improve. I think that's the one thing we all strive for. If you found value in today's episode, share this with a friend. Until next time, get agile and stay agile.